The flow field lets you take uh, surfaces such as nerve surfaces, poly meshes, or curves and use those to emit forces to affect your particles. So what I've got here is an emitter that's emitting some streak particles and what I'll do is start off uh, with a curve. So basically I'll just draw out a path that I want these particles to follow. And then have both of them selected, both the curve and the particles, doesn't matter the order, and create a flow field. So I'll walk you through some of the attributes um, for the flow field. The first one um, that I'll show you kind of gives you an ex idea of what the system is doing. So I'll turn on this preview samples and lower the samples down to 10. So with this accelerator that I've got, um, basically what it does is it takes, in the case of uh, parametric surfaces like NURBS curves or uh, NURBS surfaces, and it creates 10, in this case 10 sample points along it, which are these points in red. Um, what you see in green is the point that the particles are currently following. So as they get further along, they pick up on the next point. Uh, the number of samples does affect performance, but it's really orders of magnitude, so going up to um, you know, even 500, which is kind of a default that I use, uh, you don't really see much performance degradation, but you do get better results um, along the curve because you're sampling at more points. So running through some of the other um, attributes that we've got, there's the direction, and I'll turn off a couple of these other ones. And what the direction does is it controls how much the force the particles are moving along the tangent u, the normal, and the tangent v of the surface. Now in the case of curves, tangent v doesn't apply, but uh, you know, if I move the, uh, the curves along, tangent, uh, along the normal direction, you see they get pushed away because the, the normal of a curve points perpendicular to it. So for the curves, it makes pretty much the only sense to use tangent u. Now you can see that the particles flow along it. So I can use this direction speed or the tangent u as multipliers of that. Now you can see that the particles are sort of starting to drift off into space here. So that brings us to another of the attributes, the attraction. So attraction controls how much those particles are attracted to the point that they're currently uh, being affected by. So if I turn up the attraction pretty high, you can see that the particles follow the curve fairly well. Now what happens though is that they, they stick pretty close to the curve. Um, because the, the curve is basically emitting forces and it's not constraining them as a goal might, um, the particles do sort of fall off of the curve or, or get pulled away from it just based on how much that curvature sort of flings them off. Um, but to, to further combat these things sort of sticking directly to the curve, there's this minimum and maximum offset. So if I set that to 5, then they just get pushed off of the curve by um, sort of a random number between 0 and 5. Okay, so now we've got the, the particles moving along the curve. Um, another option that we have is to rotate them. So again here, the axis of rotation can be a few different things. We can, act, we can rotate them along the, the U uh, or the normal of the curve. In the case of the normal, it doesn't make much sense because basically the particles want to sort of spin against their direction. So to get them to rotate like a, a tornado would, um, we just want to set that rotation axis to, uh, to the tangent u. And now I can play that back. And you can see that those particles are rotating around the axis. Now each of these attributes has a, a couple of extra, or each of these sections have a couple of extra parameters. They have a, a map and uh, a, a, an attribute PP. Now the map, what it allows you to do is basically map uh, the values along the curve. Um, so in the case of uh, something like a 2D ramp, uh, a NURBS curve for example, I could just use uh, a 2D ramp that looks up um, this ramp's values based on the U parameter of the curve. So I'll uh, I'll just clean up this ramp so that it goes from black to white. And sort of doesn't kick in for a little bit and then ramps in quickly. 
So you can see that the particles don't start off with any rotation, but when they reach a certain point of view value along the curve, they start rotating. And if we wanted to, we could just make that rotation really brief, so it's just got this one sort of blip where it gets some rotation right around here, and then it stops rotating. So for the sake of, uh, I'm just going through this tutorial. Let's go back to the flow field. So, so what this does is um, that 0 to 1 value gets multiplied by the rotation speed and also by the value that you have assigned to that axis. So all these things multiply against each other. Now the PP is interesting because what it lets you do is look up on each particle a value that you can then use as a multiplier. So I'll call this one rotate dir PP. Now because uh, the rotation attribute it can basically rotate in three axes. This is expecting a vector per particle attribute as opposed to a single float. So now when I go to my particles, I can add an attribute as a vector array per particle called rotator pp. And when the particles are born, I can create um, pretty simple expression on them. So rotator pp is equal to, again it's a vector, so the, uh, the first attribute is the one that we want to affect. So what I'm going to do is just basically get, um, I want it to either be negative 1 or 1. And I don't want to have any rotation along the normal or the tangent b. So now when the particles are born, you can see that some of them are spinning clockwise and other ones are spinning counterclockwise. So each of these attributes, um, when it asks for a PP, is that, that's what it's doing. Uh, a couple of other options that you've got here are uh, magnitude PP, so how much overall force is, is happening per particle, and then you've also got your distance, um, you can turn on and off a, a maximum distance, so if the particles go, let's say, further than five units away, they just stop being affected. You can see these guys just sort of go off into the distance, because they're no longer being attracted by the curve. Um, you can also use a falloff curve to adjust how the falloff occurs as it goes from sort of zero units to five units away. You can sort of indirectly uh, adjust that ramp. Now the, uh, the geometry that's being used right now is a curve, but let's just copy this tab over here and uh, I'll create a helix. So if you open up the hypergraph um, for a piece of geometry and basically get the shape node, so here's the, the helix shape, you can middle mouse button drag that onto the flow geometry. So now the particles are being affected by this helix curve. And the helix curve happens to be a few units away, so you can see some of these guys are uh, getting attracted to it and they start to move along it. So really quickly you can switch the kinds of geometry that you're